I work with a charity, mainly, and the, the team that I'm part of mainly does live events and video production. So not normally Blender stuff. Um, I do a lot of live sound, so running sound uh, for events, uh, video, cameras, documentary shooting, that type of thing. And so one of our other teams that's part of this charity based in Ireland um, came to us and said, we do a lot of work with puppets. We go around to different schools and we do presentations and shows with the puppets. And we just were asked to do a show on television on the Irish national um, channel RTE. And we did a show with them, but it was a live puppet, like a school performance, and we tried to film it and we'd really like to make a, a product that's actually designed for video. So what could we do would be really cool with puppets and video and stuff, and so we got involved, and they came over uh, to our base uh, earlier this year, sort of April, May time, and we shot this 45-minute script that we'd written together with all the puppets on green screens, and um, we'd never done green screen stuff before, <laughs> and they'd never done green screen stuff before, so we bought these really cheap, nasty suits off eBay, which were kind of scary. And um, the puppets um, moved around, and then we had to somehow put them into a 3D set to make this, this show. Uh, you might have guessed it's a Christmas show by the costume. Uh, the other costumes might have given you a different impression. So uh, this is, has been quite a... It, almost every part of Blender I've used as part of this project, so I'm going to cover the whole thing really quickly now. Please shout if you want me to talk about more different bits of any part of this. Um, I have other stuff available I can show as well, but I thought I'd just cover the whole lot to start with and we'll see how we go. So, set design. Um, the, the concept they wanted was a generic late night talk show type thing, but puppets don't have legs. So you can't really sort of sit down on couches, so we've got this uh, desk that they sit behind. And we've tried as much as possible to design it for puppets that don't have legs. I think four puppets in the whole show have legs. Um, you can see most of them there. And we needed to map them all into a set that somehow worked together. They wanted it to be really photo real. We wanted it to be much more cartoony. Uh, do you know Calvin and Hobbes, the little cartoon guy with he has this great line, which is, a good compromise leaves everyone unhappy. Which, hopefully, we somehow managed to get a compromise that wasn't quite like that. So th this is a mixture of semi-cartoony, semi-photo, almost not quite real. So a studio set, by definition, is very evenly lit. So I can't hide all of my mistakes and my laziness behind sort of a bit of extra cloud or fog or something. I intend to add a whole bunch of lens flare and stuff later to cover all of the mistakes, but I've not got there yet, so you can see them all. Here's the basic set that um, I came up with and made in Blender. They wanted to have world landmarks in the background, so most of those were sculpted in Blender. The tree I didn't make, that one's a Creative Commons one uh, from one of the download sites. The community is fantastic. There's so much resources available. Uh, this is where the band is. Here's the Blender set. It's fairly low resolution, actually, for this complex of thing. It's 500,000 um, faces for the whole thing, so it's, it's really low resolution, really. Um, here's a quick pan across the front. Rendering this took quite a long time. Um, we don't have a render farm, and we don't have a lot of money, so I got a whole bunch of just random computers stuffed in corners, all sort of rendering like crazy to make things happen. Um, here's some of the background objects um, sculpted in Blender really quickly off photo um, references. Blender's really good for coming up with really quick concept stuff. The logo as well was another fun thing to come up with. They wanted it to look sort of neon, so I had to come up with how do I get neon in Blender that actually looks like neon and doesn't take four years to render. So um, the way the neon's actually working is there's two different objects inside the neon tube. There's a tube inner element filament layer, which is emitting like crazy. Then an outside layer, which is 
uh, using, what's, I keep on forgetting the word, refraction um, type thing to scatter the path and you can actually see the glow coming through there, which looks, looks very glowy, I like it. Um, and then using some uh, Fresnel stuff to give more glossy around the edges and things. And then an emit node on the, the same shader, but only for non-camera arrays. So the outside tubing emits to the world and you don't have to, it doesn't have to bounce through that in order to figure out um, where the actual light's coming from, which got rid of a ton of the fireflies. So pre-visualization for the uh, puppets thing. The original version of the pre that we did was a scratch track, us just um, talking through the script and the producer made this in PowerPoint. Welcome everyone to the night show with your favorite and not to mention very handsome host, yours truly, Eddie. Tonight, the show is full of surprises. Everyone will be surprised if they find the floor manager behind the presenter's desk. Come on, get out of there. We're live in 60 seconds. Well, I just thought that... Eddie! So, very clunky. Those are photographs of the puppets we were given. If I'd been cleverer, I think I would have got the producer to do it all in Blender. Unfortunately, I wasn't ready for that, and he wasn't ready for that, and we didn't manage to. Um, I wrote a small Blender plugin, which is a camera switcher, which is available in the usual places, GitHub and on the uh, plugin repository, which lets you jump between different cameras by just clicking the preview button, and then you can, if you press take, it inserts a marker in the timeline and jumps to that camera when you get to it. So it's much like working on a standard vision mixer. And this means you can actually play through the entire thing and just cut to different cameras when you feel like it, cut to a tight, cut to a wide, and it just works. I think this could be developed a bit further. Um, there's a lot of, I'd really like it to be able to see the different cameras and have viewpoints and things doing clever stuff, but I didn't get that far. This worked for where we were up to. So this was then the pre in Blender of the same scene. Welcome everyone to the night show with your favorite and not to mention very handsome host, yours truly, Eddie. Tonight, the show is full of surprises. Everyone will be surprised if they find the floor manager behind the presenter's desk. Come on, get out of there. We're live in 60 seconds. Well, I just thought that... Eddie, count us down. So that's the pre in Blender, which again was only a maybe a week if that's to do um, not working full time. Blender's really good at this. I think we could do a lot more with Blender for pre for choreography, for stage shows and stuff. It's very easy to say, we want this character to move in from stage left, and then this other character come in, we'll, they'll talk for a bit and then they move off again. And then use Blender's cameras to cut between them and figure out how the show's going to work. It's really good at this. So this is then the current version of where it's up to with the actual puppets. Welcome everyone to the night show with your favorite, and not to mention very handsome host, yours truly, Eddie. <sighs> Tonight the show is full of surprises. Well, everyone will be surprised if they see the floor manager behind the presenter's desk. Come on, get out of there. We're live in 60 seconds. Uh, well, I just thought that... Uh, uh, Eddie, camera's down, <laughs> the bend is ready, and we need to start rolling. Oh, all right, all right. Positions, people, let's move. Quiet on the set. We are live in five, four, uh, one, action. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, monsters and animals, let's give a very warm welcome to the one, the only, Daniel Dog. to be here with you this evening. We're starting the most wonderful time of the year, a time of joy, of celebration, of family and friends. It's Christmas time, so tonight we have a very special program for you. Lots of toys, good food, music, and a wonderful star guest. That's right, my friends. As Christmas is just around the corner, Billy and his bands are ready to put us in the right mood. Here they are now to bring us joy to the world! <laughs> So 
so it's it's come along as you can see. There's There's still a lot to do. The audio mix still needs some work. There's a lot of little edges, little keying glitches and stuff, which we're working on cleaning up. It's a 45-minute show, so it's quite long. And during this year, um, because of various management decisions, um, our team has divided. Half the team moved to Atlanta. Um, two of the other guys have left, moved on to different places. So it's just myself and another guy working on this at the moment. And... Um, Neither of us have done anything like this before, so it's uh, fun. So the two types of, well, three types of shots we've got in a production like this are static background shots, where the camera stays the same pretty much the whole time. There's moving shots, and then there's other random stuff. As much as possible, we wanted to use static shots, because then you only had to render it once. Uh, most of the renders for the, the scene take between 45 minutes and an hour and a half to render the shot. So if every single frame um, takes that long, it's gonna take us months to render, which we don't have. So we've done a lot of the stuff in Final Cut Pro, um, just doing the compositing, and then the Blender stuff is there already. Moving shots, again, we've tried to do the same kind of thing in Blender. Often in a television program, in a studio thing, you actually use the same shot lots and lots of times. You'll have a camera that slowly pans across the back of the audience, and it's exactly the same shot four times during the show. But it's the puppets or the, the actors are doing different things each time. So it's been a lot of working out what shots do we need, render it first, and then composite it multiple times. And um, I've stuffed up a lot with that, which has made life really complicated. So here's Final Cut. You can see uh, a lot of the different layers going on. Final Cut is um, great if you want to work its way, otherwise it's a pig. It's really, really irritating in very specific ways. And <laughs> otherwise, for some things, it's great. It's very, very fast. Um, this type of shot we can't do in Final Cut. It's just way too complicated. So we've done this in Blender, actually, is by keying all of the characters first and then shoving them on planes inside, the, inside Blender and then rendering that out, rendering out a reflection pass as well for the floor and desk and so on, then compositing that into the previously rendered main 3D scene. I can show you the compositing and stuff if you're interested as well. You see that now? Or, sure. Um, so, here is, there's the main set. You can see just the background. It's, looks okay, you can see it? Cool. Um, then we've got the shadow pass here. So this is actually is updated when, when the characters move. So if they are moving around, you can actually see the shadows change, which really helps to add to the realism and stuff. We then, it's rendered quite low sample rate, so we blur it and do a couple of other little hacks to make it mix in nicely. Um, there's another extra layer you can see down there with just the spotlight for one of the characters on because we wanted that to do some slightly different things. Um, there's an o the overlay layer with the uh, foldback monitors, piano cover, that sort of stuff that's there. Um, mask for a bit of hair to make the hair match in better. If you look at the hair of the character there, um, there's still a bit of the keying that just went wrong. So just using the mask there to sort of tidy that up. So there's lots of different bits going on. Sometimes the depth stuff got confused, I think possibly to do with 16-bit and 8-bit channel depths and stuff, which, again, I had no clue what I was doing. So it just sort of ended up working eventually. Um, here you can see the bits starting to come together, lots and lots of nerdy stuff. You can see she's actually floating ever so slightly there, but probably no one's going to notice. So it's okay, we can move on. And then there's a little bit of extra um, magic thrown on top just to make it feel a little bit um, more camerary. So that's roughly what we're doing to make, sort of make the whole thing composite together.
talk more about that later if you're interested. So then here's um, one of the final shots. There's a bit of extra glitchy stuff on the sides, but ignore that. It comes together quite well. And we've used this same camera movement six or so times throughout the whole piece, and there's a couple of other camera moves. But again, it only needed rendered once. Uh, the lighting will be re-rendered as different lighting things to go over the top of that. So this was um, one of the big tasks was going through and keying all of the different puppets and then producing small PNG files or a whole series of them that were the right size to, to fit in nicely. Um, some things Blender was great at, other things we did in Final Cut because it was just quicker and I could get other people who knew Final Cut to do the work. Um, delegation's a good thing. There's, um, I can show you the, the keying blend for this if, you, if people are interested as well or not. Yeah, okay. So here's the drummer. Um, there, there's the, the drummer, there's a, a garbage mask around him there. One of the things I realized was that the drums are very reflective and they don't move. So actually I don't need to worry about the keyer at all. Stuff the keyer, I'm just going to mask that out and then muck around with the colors later. The symbols were a right stinking pain because they're green, they've become green. Another thing which was a pain was his hair. It's the same color as the suit. So yes, lots and lots of nasty little things to make my life difficult. Um, I'm using another mask here just to monkey with the colors of the cymbals and the, the drum metal. There's a core mask which is there. Um, so you can see there's the original footage. Um, there I've cropped it to the approximate right size. The cropping tool is cool um, and being able to shift stuff around, move things in the right place is great. Some, one thing that would be really nice to have in Blender would be a way to see what the output size is going to be. Because if you just render this now, um, just that, well, there it's correct. But if I Okay, I can't render it now. It's in the wrong place, it needs shifted, and there's no way when you're looking at this picture here to see where the actual outline is. So I developed a small trick for that, um, which is create a new, or a mask input. Look at the mask, you can then see what the final output size is going to be exactly. So if we look at that, um, we look at this, you can see it's not quite the right size. So we just turn on the grease pencil, draw a box around what you want it's going to be, then go back to here, now you can see what you need to do to move it. Grease pencil's wonderful. Really stupid, ugly hack, but it works. The, the grease pencil is one of those things which it makes the whole of Blender's technical thing feel more artisty because, yeah, literally just grab a Sharpie and write on something is what we do. Um, so here's more of the shots, um, which then come together into shots like this. So there's lots of other layers going on. I've rendered a whole ton of light beams following the tutorial from the um, commanders, however you pronounce them, thing. They did some awesome tutorials on how to make light beams that look great. And so I've rendered a ton of light beams and can put them all over the place. Keying. Final Cut Pro has great defaults for keying. Frequently, you can just drop the keyer on a video clip and it's done, or done enough. It has very nice tactile feeling controls. Um, Blender, the default color for the keyer is white, and all you have is sliders. So it's very unintuitive to work with, but really powerful. Doing multiple layers in Final Cut is horrible. Masking is obscene. Blender, it's great. You just create a mask, root stuff in. You want to do two different masks, two different keys, create a single mask to split the two and then root it both ways. It works really nicely. In Final Cut, you change a mask, you've then got to duplicate the mask onto a different layer. It's horrible. Being able to attach the preview node to anything is great. Uh, Final Cut, you can't. Um, 
Final Cut has instant feedback of stuff. So you make a change, it's done like that. Blender takes a couple of seconds to update the whole compositing chain. It's pretty horrible. These are the two keyers, or the two main keys side by side. You, there's a whole ton of extra uh, special keys which you often use and bring in. But this control here, this circle control, for selecting which color you're using is really nice. As an artist, it, it feels very obvious what it's doing. Um, Blender's controls don't feel obvious, even though they do almost exactly the same thing. Um, Blender could be improved by some good defaults. Caching of nodes would be really, really nice for instant feedback. Cachering of rendering for of, of the whole thing so you can do real-time playback. There's a, a trick, there's a video about it just recently showed up on one of the news sites, how you can use the sequencer to automatically cache stuff. It's cool, I've tried it once now because I only found out about it like this week. <laughs> and I wish I'd known about it like three months ago. Also on my wish list would be an output border size. Being able to temporarily parent mask points would be really cool. If you're masking a symbol crashing up and down or something moving in front of something else, it'd be really nice to create the mask, parent it to the moving object. As soon as it's moved off, unparent it again and it just keeps working. But it doesn't quite work that way. Um, and a bit more AI, mag sort of artificially intelligent magic would be really nice in Blender. If you create a new mask and then you go to the node editor and you create a mask input, it's a reasonable guess that you actually want that same mask. So it'd be really cool if it would just say, oh, I know what you're doing, and that was the default. Um, some other tricks, um, keying input freeze frame. Um, if we go back to the, the drama again, if we look here, you can see the, the green on the background isn't actually a particularly even color. And th this is not the best shot to show it with. You can use, there's a keying, some keying tools which help really well for that to be able to select what color you want. If you have objects moving in front of your keying screen thing, it messes it up. You can actually just freeze frame the first frame of your shot before any characters are there and use that as your keying in color input for the entire rest of the shot. That way, whatever unevenness is in your background disappears. Blender can do that, Final Cut can't. Blender can do a lot of things that Final Cut can't, must be said. Um, if stuff is static and the key just isn't working, just mask it. It's really, really good, the masking tools. Um, one thing we often did was filling in the backgrounds of the keyed stuff with black before saving it out. When you save a transparent PNG, it still has the color information of the background. So if it's quite complicated with lots of different shades, you can end up with PNG files which are like 10 megabytes. If you just fill it with black, it's transparent anyway, suddenly the PNG shrinks down to a megabyte. So if you've got, say, 10,000 frames, it's actually quite a lot of file size space saved. Um, don't be afraid of using multiple keyers. It's fine, it works really well. Reverse keying. If you have an orange puppet, why not use a keyer to only select the orange and then reverse the mask and use that as an uh, input to a different keyer? It worked really well and saved me a lot of time. And finally, get someone else to do all of the grunt boring work because it's, yeah, really nice people who will do that for you if you can find them. Rendering was really difficult. We didn't have a render farm. I tried a bunch of different ones, but one of the problems I had was that with a single shot with, say, 15 puppets, um, each of those 15 puppets is a, a separate frame, and every single frame it changes. So to, to pack the blend file with the entirety of the animation in means you end up with a, a packed blend file, which is, say, 40 or 50 gigabytes in size, which is a bit unwieldy. And it didn't work very well, so we ended up using a shared render space, like um, a shared network drive, which we mapped to the same point on every computer that way, if I screwed up with the relative path names or anything, it didn't matter because the absolute path name was the same anyway. So it'd be really nice to develop more of, um, I think that there's lots of pipeline stuff that's ha supposed to be happening this year and there's uh, the asset management stuff which is coming along and I'm so excited about it, um, but we weren't able to so I just had to hack it. You can do CPU and GPU rendering on the same machine concurrently. 
just open a second instance of Blender and run it in the background. And, well, well set it to the right settings, of course. Um, shared network space is what we used. Um, if you're using Unix, then if you've got, say, 20 computers all rendering and one of them crashes, if you're using the placeholders thing, it will leave a zero-sized file in place. So if you look at the directory, you don't necessarily see that there's a problem. But you can, say, find um, where the size is zero and delete it, and then start the process again, and your faster computers will fix the problem. Um, you can use the animation render to render multiple shots overnight. So what I did, if I wanted, say, six different camera shots to be rendered, I could set up an animation where the first frame was on this camera shot, the second frame was this camera shot, third frame was that one, then tell it to render overnight, and it would render those six different camera shots for me. So uh, the camera switcher plugin I wrote worked really well for that. I also made a bunch of mistakes with it. Um, if you have multiple sizes that you want to render, like a really big panoramic shot and a couple of smaller shots, use different scenes and link back to the original data. Uh, you can do scene linking, works really well. That way you can have whatever resolution and render settings and samples you need for the different render settings. Um, we didn't use the um, distributed render render bot stuff. I tried it out and I struggled with the whole the difference with um, things being missing. I ended up using a program called Ansible, which is used for um, DevOps, like orchestrating loads of different servers. You can actually use that to run lots of different Blender instances on computers too. So um, that's everything that I had sort of prepared. Um, if there's people, if you have any questions or anything, you can ask them now or later or anything. Yes? Yeah? The, the rest of the people on my team all know Final Cut and use that all the time. Right. Yeah. So they're able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most of what we do is uh, documentaries, and Final Cut works okay for that. Um, it's also a lot cheaper. Over, if you, with Final Cut, you only have to buy one license, and it lasts forever. With um, Creative Suite, wonderful as it is, you have this monthly thing, yeah, which we couldn't afford. The ones I tried was um, Render Street, Sheep Farm, Sheep, sheep Render, um, Lion Render, and a couple others. And I used them for rendering some of the big static shots when I needed to have something done the next day for one of the other editors to work on. Um, but just distributing terabytes of video footage around between render farms, I. Yeah, there's a session about it. Yeah. We're using a program called Resilio Sync, um, which is like BitTorrent Sync, but the new branding version of it. To, to share a lot of our files between our server and other things. Works really well, it's free, it's peer-to-peer -peer on your local network. Um, I really recommend it for if you're needing to distribute files around the place. Any more questions? I shouted at it and cursed it and kicked it and eventually decided that 
it, it seemed that it was only in the 3D viewpoint that viewport that there was a problem. When you actually render it, it updates the, the chain properly. No, I, I never found a workaround for it, and it would drive me crazy. Yeah. I tried baking, um, but apparently I'm not very good at it. Yeah. Um, I can cook pasta and noodles and stuff, but my wife does the baking, and it seems the same with Blender. I tried, and I just ended up with really horrible results. And after three days of trying it, I was just like, ah, I give up. So, yeah, I fail. Camera projection? Oh, right. Um, we did a similar kind of thing just by rendering really big static pictures. Um, I did some work with motion actually doing some um, one shot. Um, let's see if I can find it. Nope, that has the old version. Here we go. Th this is motion. Notes people, five minutes. Next part is Shafty. Kids, you can go back this way. But oh, wait, wait, wait. Are we done already? Eddie, that conversation was just getting interesting. I saw one. Yeah, basically, yeah. So it's multiple ob 2D objects moving around and then 2D, 2D effects for the whole thing. Cool. Tell me about it. I want to learn. Cool. Yeah, it'd be great. To mask the um, not for the keying. No, I didn't try that. Sounds like an interesting technique. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, it'd be great. We didn't, most of, well, the entire set is in Blender, so it wasn't such an issue for us. Um, the drums are a static thing anyway, so just a 2D mask actually worked oh, fine okay. most of the time. Um, the sim. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, so here's the shader tree for the neon. Um, 
started off by you split whether it's a camera array or not. If it's not a camera array, then it just emits light. So every other element on the scene doesn't have to try and do any clever bouncing and stuff through there. It just treats it as a light. And then the reflections work nicely, or nice enough, because you generally can't tell at that distance. Um, otherwise, it's um, a standard uh, mix on the layer weight, the Fresnel thing. Um, either refraction, which is for rays coming straight into it, so 